This week, Love and Rockets Month concludes, as you'll hear Coombs' interview with creator Jaime Hernandez. It's episode 548 from May 22, 2017, which also includes a discussion I had with Mulele back then about the state of Marvel Comics. We hope you'll spread the word about deconstructing comics. Tell your friends about us, share episodes on social media, and also send us suggestions for topics we could cover. Email us at mail at deconstructingcomics.com. This is Tim, and this is Deconstructing Comics. Welcome to Deconstructing Comics. This is Tim in Tokyo. This week, we'll hear Coombs' interview with Love and Rockets creator Jaime Hernandez. He'll talk about Maggie and Hopi, the dynamics of working on something with your brother, why he gravitates toward female characters, his influences and art style, and more. Also, I'll be talking with Mulele about the state of Marvel Comics. First, just a reminder that you can help this podcast by making your Amazon purchases via deconstructingcomics.com slash Amazon and make that your bookmark for future purchases. We'll then get a percentage of what you spend. It costs you nothing extra and helps us cover web hosting and the other costs of presenting the show every week. Okay, so um, the focus of my... Uh uh, assignment while I'm posting these interviews is to more focus on the writing, but I'm going to get you to talk as a cartoonist in general. Uh, so my first question is about Maggie and Hopi, the center of your work. Um, I know that Love and Rockets Volume 3 is wrapping up, and about a couple of issues ago, you had that wonderful story with Ray and Maggie where we kind of see them backwards and forwards in time, kind of mirrored, and it's sort of seemed like it kind of came to a kind of a wrapping up. It kind of felt like the water was kind of swirling out of the drain in a very satisfying, beautiful way. But the last couple of issues have featured Maggie and Hopi. And once again, you're kind of looking at um, their relationship, their friendship, and its strange contours and anxieties. Um, Do you feel that you're going to be working on Maggie and Hopi pretty much your entire life or your entire career. Uh, are we in the middle of Maggie and Hopi? Um, could I get you to talk about that? Uh, I'll, I'll do Maggie and Hopi as long as, um, as long as I have ideas <laughs> for them. Um, um, I won't always do them. Obviously I take breaks. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I've got no reason not to do them, you know. Sure. Um, I uh, I like writing Maggie more than I like writing Hopi right now. But um, what about Maggie versus Ray? Uh, I like it. I I like writing them too. I just uh, Maggie is such a uh, powerful force for me that she kind of hogs all the stories <laughs> uh-huh. because, because I know her so well and because her um, emotion, her personality, her uh, just everything about her just takes over for yeah. me. And, um, and then when, uh, by the time the story is finally finished, I'm like, okay, I'm going to give Maggie a break, you know, because I just want to, concentrate on other things and then I bring her back in and then and then she does the same thing she just takes just, uh, kind of soaks up the air in the room you know yeah I mean as a reader I definitely find that she is extremely relatable like you get to a feeling in your work where you feel like you wrapped up a thing like with the love bunglers but then you bring her back and time has moved and there's like this new version of her that's just as compelling as anything before. And sometimes when I read your other stuff, like when you try to do a Tonta story or Angel is a good example, Angel of Tarzana, she sort of seems like a bit like a prototypical Maggie, but 
they don't have the same weight and roundedness and contours that Maggie does. So I to- as a reader, I totally um, see that. But you were about to talk about Hopi because you were saying you don't enjoy writing Hopi as well. And I've noticed that with Maggie, you get a lot of interior monologue, whereas with Hopi, you never do really. Like maybe the story that most sticks out is the one where she's teaching. And I, I think that's collected in the, the Miseducation of Hopi Glass or whatever that, that one's called. And that's a very sympathetic portrayal of Hopi. But still, you're looking at Hopi from the outside, and she's a very cutting, fleeting, you know, bit of a, she's got a bit of a demon in her. She's a bit of a sprite. So, like, how do you, which is great because they're contrast, but where do these characters come from? Are they based on people you've known, people you've grown up with? Where do you look for in terms of, defining them now in your career, like 20, 25 years on? Um, now they've taken a life on, of their own. So I'm not, I don't think, I rarely think outside of them. Right. You know, I just know them so well. When I said um, Hopi, uh, I didn't enjoy writing her. It's just at the moment, I don't, I, she's a struggle. Um, it's a struggle to write her because I don't know her as well anymore. Sure. Uh, she's uh, she's kind of a person that I, I'm i not um, that close to. Like if she was in real life, yeah. that she would come in and out of my life, but I don't really know what makes her tick. And so it's always interesting, but sometimes a struggle just to right. just figure out where she belongs. And right. that was of on purpose um so it's uh you know maggie just spills out of me uh hopi right. i have gone and uh it's not always fun because i i'm not sure i make the right decision with her yeah uh, in in the direction she goes and and i'm trying to uh uh, while at the same time I don't want her like Maggie, I mean, um, easy to write, but at the same time I wish she was. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's what makes such an effective contrast. I mean, I don't, I don't think you've made a single wrong step in any of your stuff with Maggie and Hopi. And I'm not just saying that to, to you know, kiss your ass, really. I mean, I, I, I really think that stuff is endlessly fascinating, especially the whole, you know, how Hopi deals with her relationship with Maggie, knowing that she can't completely have her, but, you know, has to make allowances. And, you know, um, I was just rereading that story last night with Tony Chase, where Merry Christmas says, uh, in a, you know, rare moment of vulnerability, Hopi admitted that the only way she was going to have her is if she made allowances, even to the point that she's fine with her marrying other people and, you know, as long as she can. And yeah, at the same time, there's a very warm, like actual connection between them. Sorry, I should get to a question. Um, You were saying at this point that, uh, that you just work with the characters as you know them. They're not based on other people in terms of either drawing or, or writing. Um, do you do you get models in? I mean, you have you're known for like very realistic drawing. I know it's taken on a very cartoony kind of lexicon as well, and in, in more more recent times, and um, you have very realistic scenes with them, so extremely realistic moments and writing. Um, so, what are your influences or inspiration? Like, where do you get that from? I guess. Oh. Um. Oh, uh, gee, uh, from everything, um, you know. Are you reading movies. constantly? No, not really. I'm I'm really um, just observing the way uh, people are. Um, I'm not out studying people. But yeah. I I listen and I watch a person talk many times, and I and I just n- notice what what where they're coming from or where they're not coming from or um i just 
been observant that way since I was very young, and I know what I kind of know what makes uh, people do the things they do every once in a while. Right. Um, and is this, you know, sorry, is but, this is this mostly a, a close circle of people that you know that you observe, or are you the kind of person that just goes out and sits in a mall and just goes to like a street carnival and observes people or um i don't i don't purposely go out and do that but if i'm in a situation like i do go to a mall like i'll take my daughter to the mall or something because i never go but <laughs> yeah um i i will i'll sit there and i'll watch and i'll watch um the different uh, kinds of people and the different um people where they stand in society, you know, and, and just notice the, the haves and the have nots and the, you know, and, and how, how they, uh, relate to shopping differently, right, right. you know, and, and things like that. So just simple things like that. It's just something I'm curious. I've always been curious about. And when I found out that I kind of was good at putting that down on paper, I kind of took advantage of it because, uh, you know, I've, wh- wh- whether I have uh, certain limits in uh, in my work, you know, certain artistic limits, um, I concentrate on on what I'm best at. Right, right. Um, I mean, you were talking about Hopi a second ago and about making choices with her. Maybe it's because she comes in momentarily that it, it seems so effective. Like, I mean, it's always kind of a zinger. When she has something to say, it's pregnant with a lot of emotion, but also kind of a bit of an edge and a, you know, a sharp dig and a, and a, it's there to like disarm the other person so that she's not going to be hurt. Um, how do you go about those constructing those moments? Cause I think that's part of like what you talk about when you say you have certain strengths or certain techniques it's it's a very it's not a linear way of writing. It's not a linear way of constructing comics, and I don't just mean you jump around in time. I mean like the moments. Like how do you pick those moments and make them just have that feel that gets into uh, you? It's uh, it's gonna sound simple. It's not. It's I've taken my whole life to get this. <laughs> yeah. You know, but but. Basically, I'm thinking the whole time, okay, these characters I'm using, who are they and how would, how would they end up? How would they, how would they deal with a situation? Basically, Hopi is, uh, is, uh, a reactor. She, she just, uh, she has no thought balloons anymore. In the early days, she did, but I decided to take out her thoughts right. because you're not supposed to know what she's thinking. Right. Oh, Hopi is just uh, someone who's just going to come out with something, and you never know what it's going to be. Yeah. But, but I try to remain in the in it being Hopi. It you know I don't I don't say like she's going to. Say something off the wall. I don't care what it is. We'll see what happens. You know, I right. I really I really think about um, what she's who she is when she's saying this and what the reasons are. And sometimes they're not nice things. And no, it's because of where she comes from. You know. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's just very. Hopi, and that's what when I'm when these moments come, whoever I'm dealing with, I kind of let it happen. You know, of course I'm overseeing it, <laughs> but I, I'm just I just go okay. This is the type of people they are, and I'm and I'm forcing them to be themselves. And it's not always going to be nice, or it's not always going to work, and people are going to butt heads. And, and, uh, you know, uh, yeah, basically that I'm, I'm just, uh, 
I'm just kind of an observer myself. Right. Um, when I was very young and I was reading the first volume of Love and Rockets, I often wondered if your brother, brother's character Carmen and Hopi were based on the same person. And I have to ask this question just because I've always wondered it when I was a teenager. Right. Because uh, they're kind of know. similar, don't you think, in the way that they kind of bristle? Well, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. But I don't know what Gilbert was thinking. Uh, he, uh, you never he, talked uh, about all of that stuff back then? I thought, figured you would have. Uh, we, sometimes we do, but, but we like to leave each other alone, mostly. Yeah. Um, kind of like, Gilbert's a big boy. He knows what he's doing. <laughs> right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> So I uh It's bigger than you, I think, yeah. <laughs> I I yeah, we we talk about that stuff, but uh every once in a while we could just go, Oh, huh because nobody's really like trying to copy each other or try to compare of course. Of course. each other. Yeah. You know? Um a couple of questions I can ask about that. Uh what's the next phase? Are you guys still gonna put out stuff together or are you going to do your own thing? Uh, depends. I, I don't know. In the meantime, I'm just trying to get Love and Rockets to come out regularly oh. as the comic. But aren't you wrapping uh, up this volume? I thought I thought this volume was coming to an end. Like the current series. Uh, what's the last thing you read? The last thing I properly read was um, something between Hopi and Maggie uh, out on a middle-aged kind of date okay that that was still in the uh annual um we just came out with a comic size again oh you have I'm, back, so, I'm sorry so is this a new volume has it already come out already the first uh love and rockets volume four number one yeah yeah that, sorry that i had no idea forgive me yeah. um so you're doing a new volume of stuff together called love and rockets Yes, it's a, and we're back to the magazine size like the original. Oh, that's magazine. amazing. So it's just a change in size. It's not a change in actual dynamics of... No, as, as a matter of fact, um, when we came to this decision, I, got, I was trapped in three com- continuing stories. So the first issue doesn't start fresh. It just continues from the last thing got I read. Got it. Um, I've always wondered, because if I had to work with a relative, let alone a sibling, on something that long and that meaningful to my life, I think it would be a challenge. You know, egos would get in the way. I mean, you know very well what it's like to be in a band, for example, with a with a sibling or, you know, somebody like that. Um, not yours necessarily, but like anybody's. Um, is it is it tough or... I mean, is there a competition at all or any ego bruising or is it just the most easiest thing in the world? Um, hmm. I've I've always just uh, handled it that me and my brother are doing a comic side by side. We don't collaborate. So there's that cuts down a, lo- a lot of uh, right. tension and clashing, yeah. you know. Um, I trust Gilbert as a fantastic artist. Yeah. And that I will. I'm always proud to be next to him, and it, it's not like I'm uh, ashamed of what he did in this issue or something. No, <laughs> never, know? never. And that's and that's part. And that's a big part of that is is because, like I said before, he's a big boy. I know Gilbert yeah. knows what he wants to do, and as long as I don't have to drag him along then they has there doesn't have to be a clash you know? no yeah. that's great um both of you are known for your female characters um so once again an apologies if this has been asked to you a thousand different times in a thousand different ways but uh, what is it about women characters that draws you uh why are you so astute with women characters. Um, do you have a theory as to what makes women characters uh, stronger characters on the page, or what makes them tick? 
Uh, God, there's a million answers for that. Mm -hmm. Um, The main one is I don't know, but um, I just love women. I I like women, and I like drawing women, and I like, uh, and it's the right thing to do. Uh, And I've been told that I just have an insight, you know, that I understand. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's a it's a million things, you know. I I get my cake and I eat it too, you know. Sure. Um, well, what about drawing them? I mean, your 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 body language and the little touches, um, you know, in terms of depicting physique, are, are incredible. So at this point, like, do you ever look at references or? Um, I think I already asked you about models, and I'm not sure if you do. I have a feeling you don't. I feel it's it's like a very kind of studied cartoon lexicography you've developed that's based on, you know, I guess going back, Hank Ketchum and, and Sean Ramita and Kirby and people like that and Dandy Carlo. But at this point in your career, how do you get those, you know, those little things that just snap together and work together so well? I... It's, uh, I guess the main thing is whatever they're talking about, the drawing has to help. And the drawing, and a lot of the writing is in their action, is in their expression, is in their, Mm. in their, uh, just the way they, they, they're postured. Um, it, I've, I went through uh, a big time, I'm trying not to as much, but where people weren't even looking at each other because they had to look at the reader in order for you to get the (laughs) the gist of what they they were thinking. And I felt guilty about that because I got, they're not even looking at each other (laughs) (laughs) when they're talking, (laughs) you know? And, uh, but, but, um, but it actually helped you as a reader feel like you were sitting at the bar with them. So it had that positive effect as well, although I can see why you'd get frustrated with it after a while. Yeah, because I try I try to put as much reality, realism, even if it's just lines on paper. I yeah. try to put as much as I can, but sometimes you have to sacrifice it for tricks. You sure, know, like, sure. uh, like I said, um uh, facing forward so you know so the reader can know what's going on you know um yeah you know it can, it can be frustrating to go see your favorite band and the whole time the guitar player is staring at his speaker sure sure <laughs> you know and uh so it's 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 just it's just a juggling act constantly constant juggling act every panel that has a um multiple things going on it like one person is angry and the other person is trying to avoid that you know i'm it's a constant juggling act of how to place the characters and how to and how to make them look good on the page and to do a good drawing and to get the point across I, it's just i'm just so used to that now but i can see how that would drive someone crazy yeah well i think your earlier stuff was very realistic it was very rounded it had a lot of shading and depth and cross hatching and the detail of course but now i feel like you've gone for more like cartoony aesthetics which is really interesting because it works very well with the timing like you say like a character will say something and then you have to notice the reaction on the other person's face or the way their body reacts because it's very precise and it's very styled and also that kind of combination between the fairly adult edgy tone of what they're saying plus the cartooniness of the way they're drawn is a really interesting I don't know, for me it's 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 working really well most of the time. I don't know if that's your intention, but that's what I got from it. And I, I, well yeah, that's yeah, I'll I'll use like I was talking about tricks, I'll use um 
I'll use things to make that point kind of come across a hundred percent. Um, you know, if I, if I want it vague where I kind of leave the reader a little in the dark or I, or I let, allow the reader to make up their own mind, you know, that's a different story. But, um, yeah, I, uh, you know, I've gotten through all these years, I've, I've finally come to a point where the art is, is exactly what it is. And I didn't even notice that it went from one point to another. Um, right. You know, getting rid of the cross hatching and stuff. I just found the most important lines that needed to be put down when, uh, when I think of uh, somebody else drawing this and then saying, "Well, I'm going to add my touch to it," I go, "Well, what the, what's there to add? <laughs> because it's all there, even if it's gone from to become very simple in just lines and expression. It just it's kind of like." you know, all it needs. When when someone asks me to draw, you know, I've done a, a couple of Archie covers. Um, sure, yeah, the, the they're Archie. nice. And, and uh, I was like, well, I want to put my slant on it, but at the same time, I, these characters are so iconic to me, yet the styles have changed so much over the, over the years. Um, I don't know what I could add. <laughs> so I draw what I draw. You know, I just put the lines that I put down. And but it also just ends up like, looking like oh, a Jaime I Hernandez put... page, you know? What's that? It just looks like, looks like a Jaime page, like those women hanging around. Like, I remember one in particular is kind of wearing sort of almost like a tracksuit kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, and the hair and the body posture. It just, it's like Archie through Jaime Hernandez's world kind of thing, you know? Yeah, because that's and and it it may sound silly to some people, but because that's the way I draw, <laughs> you know that's that's yeah. I can't see what else I could put into it that would help it. Sure. You know. Um. You know, and and hopefully there's something in there that I didn't notice that I added that was my own touch. You know. Uh, sure. Because um, you know I've been told that someone would see a drawing of mine and they would say, God, you did this with so many lines, yet you're just saying something so... You're saying something here. And I'm like, right, right. sure, sure. And then I have to go look at it and go, what did I do? <laughs> right, right. Um, I just have a couple more questions, and I think we can wrap up. One is, like, over the years, you've developed quite a sprawl in terms of stories. And, um, you know, going mapping characters through time and also branching out with other characters that they know and minor characters and things like that. Do you plan stuff out? Do you map stuff out? Or do you just literally go with whatever you feel like in terms of direction and storyline or story arc at that time? Um, uh, both. Uh, mo- mostly, I'm just going as a, doing it as I go along. It's more like where the characters are going, I'm just following, yeah. you know, and, sure. uh, maybe, maybe something, uh, an interesting side story will come out of that, you okay. know, but, but I'm not, I don't have big, uh, I don't have big long range plans other than I, I hope I can do this as long as I can. But you do a little mapping and you try to make sure that you're keeping abreast of other characters and where they're going so that you're not making uh, mistakes or whatever. Uh, sometimes, but not, not, not that, too much. as much as you think. Um, and then I was also wondering, like in some of the earlier stuff, like especially the death of Speedy or just other earlier stuff, the Mexican American identity was like more forefront and it hasn't been so much in terms of what's come up in the dialogue or the stories recently. I was just wondering well, with Trump coming in and all of the crap, um, you know, about the wall and all of that, has that made you want to tackle those issues again or in any new? Um, 
I think of that stuff once in a while, but it's just whatever, <clears throat> whatever comes, you know, um, you know, I mean, when you think about it, this comic is still about Latinos. Anyway, Death of Speedy yeah. was about Latinos. Yeah, yeah. I mean, people seem to get so close to Maggie, they forget this is a Mexican girl that you might not talk to on the street. Yeah. You know. Um, well, I, so, I, I, I don't, especially when you have the stories about them as children, and you, you see it's right there, or when her brother comes back into her life, and what a horrible you know, life or experience he's having, what a unhappy, right. you know, ex- like that. You can't divorce that from their ethnic identities, I don't think. Yeah, but, but it's up to the reader, though. You know, yeah. I mean, am I doing a, a Latino comic or do I just do Latino stories once in a while? Well, they're about Latinos, you know, so I am doing a Latino story, comic. You know, I mean... yeah. Uh, but, but like I said, I let the reader make up their own mind. Sure, how they want to see it. Yeah. Well, I think also like a lot of the media exposure I saw growing up either saw you as a Latino cartoonist or more often as a, a gender, a gender-based, you know, gender theory kind of based cartoonist. But I, I've always related to them as a writer and as a lover of comics because. They just feel real to me. They feel real, and they're beautiful too, uh, in a way that a lot of comics can't quite get. You know, like right. it doesn't right. feel like the strings are being pulled, which is which is what's amazing. Man, um, I wanted to um, uh, ask a question. Okay. About, um, the state of comics. Um. It, it, it's not it's not a well formed question because it's I'm I'm just kind of it's more of a feeling I'm trying to put into words. Mm. Um, like when Paul was here, we were talking about it about the future of comics, movies versus comics, the the actual books. What what do you see as the climate of comics right now, given all the the Marvel drama and. Um, DC's lack of ability to make a movie um, <laughs> get mm. around. Well, I mean, what what I've heard from others, and I basically never read DC, but I mean, I've been hearing that DC is the best it's been in years and years right now. Mm. Um, actually, um, somebody on Facebook, um, I can't remember if it was the page or the group, but... Um, had put up this article. Um, well, you know who Brian Hibbs is? Nope. Um, he runs a couple comic shops in San Francisco. Um, I've, I've met him. He's been on the show a few times. Mm. Um, but he writes uh, this uh, column once in a while, you know, from a retailer's point of view. Mm-hmm. Um, and he, it was... This, this particular one was... Uh, what the hell is wrong with Marvel Comics anyway? Um, and so he talks about, you know, the, the discussion about diversity and whether that's good or bad. And he says, that's really not the problem. Um, the problem is that, that the market has changed and Marvel doesn't seem to get it. Um, and he talks about how like Marvel seems to be, well, part of it is Marvel has kind of chased away the fans that it had by, um, the books are too expensive and there are too many that are all tied together Mm. and people just kind of walk away because it's just too much. There are just too many books and too much money. And then he says, there are other people coming in who are interested and want to read, uh, you know, he he says he, he sells, you know, tons of saga, which, Mm. you know, from image, it's completely self-contained and people are interested in it and, and want to read it. And like the same thing will happen with a Marvel book, like uh, black Panther. Mm -hmm. But then when Marvel thinks, Oh, we've got a hit on our hands. Then they put out two more books that tie in with it Mm -hmm. and say, okay, you have to read all three of these every month or maybe twice a month uh, in order to get what's going on. And then, when that happens, then the sales of the first book drop. Ah, uh, okay. Um, because you know the, the the 
new audience isn't interested in doing it that way. They just want to read the one book every month and follow that. Right, right. Um, and so, you know, Marvel kind of shoots themselves in the foot by doing these things that maybe in the 90s worked, but right. now they don't because the, the price has gone up and the audience has changed. How much is a Marvel book now? Uh, four bucks or sometimes more. For 22 pages? Um, yeah. Yeah, just a normal size comic book. Huh. That, that, that... That seems well. It, it it is kind of expensive, but I mean, at the same time, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm charging quite a bit for my books as well. Um, <laughs> yeah. so I can't really can't really say anything there. But um, hasn't it been four bucks for a while? Um, I've kind of lost track. I'm not sure when the price last went up. Um, I think, uh, I guess there have been, there was a period where they were like, some books were two ninety nine and some were three ninety nine. I think, uh-huh. but yeah, I think now they're all three ninety nine. or if it's a larger one, then they're more, but, um, yeah, I guess they haven't, other than getting rid of two ninety nine books, they haven't really gone up recently, but it is kind of, you know, especially if it's a little kid who's, who's interested I mean, if there are any little kids interested but <laughs> right um but yeah i mean the inflation and everything but and how does that work with with trade paperbacks if everything's connected this way um yeah i don't know how they i i think that they just uh well you know the what they'll often do is that you know there's a mini series that's kind of the the main event and then like all, a bunch of other books will say, you know, this is a tie-in with the event. And then sometimes it's like, has almost nothing to do with the event actually. Right. Um, but, and I think then they'll just, you know, collect the, the mini series in its own trade paperback. And then, you know, the, the Iron Man books will just be in their own trade and whatever. Um, and so I think you'd be, you'd probably end up buying all the books if you wanted to follow it that way. Oh. Okay. Um, it, it, it just seems like a really unwieldy um, marketing strategy. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I, I suppose they're, they're using the drug dealers um, business model, <laughs> which is, you know, that first taste is free and then you got to pay for the rest, like through the nose. Um yeah, basically, I mean, a free comic book day. Which when is that? It's right around now. They they'll put print up a free something that they pass out, and then try to get you interested in buying the books. Yeah, um, yeah I never quite got free comic book day, um, but I guess I guess just the comic books themselves are not enticing enough to to pull in readers. <laughs> I don't know. Hmm. Uh, whatever, I guess. But um, still, uh, what do you see? Where do you see this going for for comics? Ooh, um, I don't want to. I don't want to put uh, Marvel in the position of being comics. Although I'm sure they'd like to think that they are comics. Um, they are one facet of comics, and uh, I'm sure everybody understands. My own thinking in this is is that superhero books or not really for me uh, at this point, uh, to, to, to put it in a very mild way, um, <laughs> are not really for me. And I don't consider them to be comics. I consider them to be uh, just just a, 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 a category of comics. Um, and the rest of comics that I, I look at are, are much, much um, more present um, than superheroes. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, you know, the movies do, to some extent, manage to draw some people in, as do, you know, the TV shows like The Walking Dead. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, just kind of, you know, doing, co- like Image, you know, think about Image, they're doing, like, a lot of different books. Um, they're creator-owned. They don't all tie into each other. 
uh, and you know, new readers can come in and say, I'm just going to read this book and they can just buy that book every month. And, you know, they might get interested in buying others, but you know, they're not, nobody's trying to force them into buying 25 books that all have something to do with each other. And I think that's, I mean, I don't, I suppose the problem then for the publishers is that if people are just buying one book, they don't make as much money as if they buy 25. So is it sustainable to do things that way? I mean, I guess image is surviving, but um, I don't know if, if, if Marvel could do things that, well, I mean, of course they're, they're killing their business the way they're doing it. So they might as well try doing it more like image. I don't know. Well, um, I don't know. It, it it just it just seems to be um, kind of abusing the reader to mm -hmm. to to force them to buy or or um, tell them that their story is not going to be split into two or three or ten different titles that they have to collect simultaneously. Yeah. Seems a little bit, um, yeah, uh, d disrespectful. Um, but. Uh, do you see this um, having a negative effect over comics overall, or do you do you feel it's it's going to be mainly just Marvel that's going to have to suffer this? Um, well, I don't know why it would affect other books too much. I mean, if DC is is interesting supposedly right now, um, you know, maybe DC and and Image and what other good books are coming from other publishers could carry the industry i don't know i mean it just it's sort of awkward though when the marvel movies are doing well to have the marvel comics not be doing well and kind of you know chasing away the new readers that they can get from the movies um i don't know it's, it's i'm not i'm not sure what what's going to happen or, or what would happen if like marvel comics went out of print if that would hurt the industry overall yeah um it certainly would be a big change mm -hmm. and to be honest yeah i i, I wouldn't really miss it although it'd be kind of weird <laughs> um but um the last time I bought a comic based on a movie that I saw was Batman 89 mm. with, uh, with Michael Keaton and uh, Jack Nicholson. That, that um, was a lot of fun when I was a kid, and um, I got interested in Batman, and I started reading the Batman comics, and the first issue I picked up was like Batman versus the Mudman or some... The Mud Pack, I think, was the name of the, the villain group, and... It was just so nonsensical, <laughs> um, and and really was far removed from from the the movie. The movie had uh, millionaire playboy who had all these cool gadgets and had a focus against this villain who was uh, not magical, just crazy. And then looking at um, this villain that could turn into mud and essentially drown Batman in, in, in mud. It just, I don't know. So suddenly it was not, it was not, it was not interesting. It was not compelling. It wasn't anything. Of course, mm. Batman gets out of it because he's Batman. Yeah. But, um, for, for myself now, um, as, as, an adult, I do watch the movies, not only the Marvel ones, but the DC ones. And I, I find some of them to be kind of compelling, but um, most of the time I'm absolutely not interested in the characters otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, even with Guardians of the Galaxy, which I quite liked, uh, I thought was very fun. I did not want to read any of the comics featuring those characters. Um, I think at this point, for me at least, the the movies and and the comics are absolutely separate. Um, it could be why I never re read uh, Star Wars comics when I was a kid, even though I absolutely loved Star Wars from 
from the age of seven. When it came time to read the comics, the comics were all kind of wonky and not really well drawn. Mm-hmm. Um, that that kind of looked like an X-wing, but wasn't really. <laughs> kind of looked like the Millennium Falcon, but they got the details wrong. So I don't know. It it, it just seems to me that they're just different things. Um, yeah. yeah. It, it's kind of like listening to uh, an album by the Beatles and watching one of their movies with some of the songs in it. I don't necessarily need to watch the movie. I just want to hear the music. Mm-hmm. This is Tim back in 2023. I hope you've enjoyed Love and Rockets Month. If this is the kind of comics talk you enjoy, consider supporting this podcast by joining us on Patreon at patreon.com slash deconcomics. And go to deconstructingcomics.com to connect to us on Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube, to shop on Amazon to support the show, and to find links to subscribe to the podcast. You can comment on any episode there or drop us a line at mail at deconstructingcomics.com. That's also the address for submitting your own comics work for possible inclusion in our spin-off podcast, Critiquing Comics. Next week, we discuss two more books from our friends at Avery Hill Publishing. Kumar and I discuss a science fiction book called The Hard Switch by Owen D. Pomery. And Emmett joins me to review Pet Peeves by Nicole Gu. Till then, this is Tim, and thanks for listening to Deconstructing Comics. (music) 